Hi. Um, so hello everyone and welcome to Coffee and Code. Uh, I hope you've all had a very nice summer and that you're very excited about another term full of great coding talks. Uh, as I've mentioned in the Slack channel, um, we still have another three sessions in need of speakers. So do let me know if you're interested in giving a talk. Also make sure to check out the Trello page and suggest uh, and vote for possible future topics. Um, join the Slack channel if you haven't already done so. So today I'm very excited to present this month's speaker. Joining us live from Germany is Matthias Stahl from the Lechtia Lab. Um, so welcome Matthias and uh, take it away. Yeah, hi everyone. Um... Yeah, I recently moved to Germany, but I still work uh, for uh, Janne Lettjö at Sidelife Lab. And uh, part of my work is uh, doing a lot of data visualization, usually with proteomics data. But uh, of course, you know, you can do exciting data vis with all types of data. And usually you do that uh, when you do it professionally in the browser so that you have interactive data visualization. and. Uh, one of the most famous libraries I would say to use here is D3. And so today we're going to talk about compelling data visualizations with D3. And first of all, I want to say that D3 is a JavaScript based and so it is running in the browser, in your browser or in your client's browser or in your cooperation partners browsers. And it's really, you have to say today that the web is the best home for good data visualizations because the browser is a software that everyone has already installed. So you don't need to run through installation processes for someone. And the browser is a very powerful uh, soft piece of software. And you can basically do everything what you can imagine in the browser. So the web is really the best home for data visualizations. And when you are in the browser, you probably want to use a framework which makes graphing easy for you in the browser and for that I really recommend the, the I say now the most famous uh, database framework what you have in JavaScript for the web and this is called D3 and D3 stands for data driven documents so everything is about the data and its connection to the elements on your web page and I just listed here a few topics that are provided by D3 there are for example shapes uh, and shapes can be simple lines or bars or everything you can draw on a piece of paper. There are interpolations and transitions. So this is some math going on there when you want to draw stuff. There is scales. So eventually you want to transfer your data, which is maybe XPy um, data points to pixel coordinates in your browser. And therefore you need scales. And D3 is also able to manipulate the DOM. So the DOM is the document object model. We look at that in a second. This is how a website basically is built. This is the tree of the elements of the websites. And D3 allows you to interact with these elements directly. So I thought about showing you some of the concepts D3 has. And then I started building some slides. And I thought, OK, this is getting a little bit far too theoretically here. So why not simply let's build stuff together? or at least I show you how I would write it. Um, and then you can see what the concepts are directly from the code. So first of all, that means we want to build a data visualization today in this session. And I thought about which data could we use. It should be publicly available. It should be understandable from a broader uh, audience. Uh, and it should be something from SciLife Lab maybe, um, because most of us are working there. And then I thought, well, there is this nice data set, what the data center provides about yearly publications from the SciLife lab and also annotated in which journals these publications appear. So I took a blank piece of paper and draw this uh, so-called steam graph uh, where you have on the x-axis the years from 2010 until today. And then um, there were a lot of different journals where we all publish. And I thought maybe it's good to just look at the top 10 journals where we publish. And then for each of these journals, draw a line or a band 
how many publications there were from SciLife Lab members in the respective years, and then you would maybe get some nice graph that you could color. And this is called in, in the data vis jargon a steam graph. And uh, this is a very nice example how you could use D3 to build a graph like that. Because D3 is a very low level library, so there is no function steam graph that you would just call and then this graph is drawn for you. No, you have to go um, far much more down. Um, you have to really draw the lines. You have to really calculate where these lines should go. You have to see where the colors go and stuff like that. And even the axis, when we want to have this 2010 to 2020 um, time axis at the bottom, we need to draw this more or less on our own. There are some helpers, but most of the stuff needs to be built on your own. That's maybe a little bit annoying because uh, it's written in JavaScript. And I don't know how many of you know JavaScript, but usually half of the audience loves JavaScript and half of the audience hates JavaScript. And it's very hard to convince the hating part to go over to the loving part, actually. Uh, but I tried it today because JavaScript is, uh, has become very powerful in recent years. And uh, yeah, we managed that together, I guess. So first of all, um, when you want to, to do this, what I show you now, uh, now live or later, maybe when you watch the video again, uh, I have in my GitHub repository, which is uh, hitch slash coffee and code 2020. I have this live coding folder and you could just clone the repo and you get the, the starter for the website there and could just do the same what I do now. And um, so I, let me just move to my console. I'm already in this live coding folder. And when I start a new web project, I uh, have a minimum of folders and files in my starting folder. And uh, yeah, the ones of you who are familiar with uh, coding for the web, they might know some of these folders and some of these files. Um, let me just explain for now that uh, it's quite important to have this package.json, which manages all the dependencies. So for example, D3 is an external library and we need to pull in this code at some place. And we have this source folder here where we write all the code. And the cool thing is this, uh, I mean, you can clone that of course from my uh, GitHub repo. And the cool thing here is there's also Webpack already installed and Webpack is a tool that lets you bundle all your web code into the final web page, and which also comes with a development server. So when I just type npm run dev, then, um, a web server is set up live on my machine and I'm going to open that not in Safari, but on Firefox because there we have better developer tools. And this already starts out uh, with the SciLife Lab publications title, but there is no data visualization yet. So let me show you how this project looks like in the code editor right now. So I make this large for a second. So this is exactly the live coding folder that I showed you in the console also. And we have now this source directory here. And the starting point for each web page and for each data visualization that you build in the web is the index.html. So this is an HTML file, which is read by the browser. And there is a head part, which defines some references, some titles and stuff like that. And the more important part for us now is the body part, which is the actual web page that we see. And I already have this H1, which is a heading, which is Scilab Lab Publications, and a smaller heading H2, which uh, is the subtitle. And then I have this div element here, which is just an ID of WIS. And within that, I want D3 to build our data visualization in there. What I also have already in a project, and that's also on GitHub, is uh, a data folder where uh, the Scilab Lab publications are in. So this is, uh, you can freely download that from the data center webpage of Scilab Lab. And this is just a CSV file where you have all the publications of Scilab Lab uh, back to 2010. And also the journals in some column. And uh, yeah. Importantly, there is now this scripts folder in our source directory where I have this index.js. And index.js is the JavaScript file we are working with. And here we write all our D3 code. 
And what you can see here is that um, JavaScript is able to work in modules. So you can import other JavaScript files. In that case, I import a style file. You can forget that for a moment. Uh, but I also import D3. And uh, this is as easy as it looks like here. So I import all the functions, name them D3 from the D3 package. And then I also import another JavaScript file, which is journals. I prepared that in advance and it looks like that. And this is just the, the top 10 journals where SciLife Lab researchers published in the last 10 years. So there is, for example, so this is an array for those of you who don't know JavaScript, but similar to Python uh, here in that case, at least. So you have an array and in that array, we have objects and these objects have a name which is plus one, for example, an ISSN. So this is unique identifier for that channel. And I also assigned already a color that we can use later to refer to that journal. All right, and this is like the top 10 journals. And with this export statement here, you say that this is able to be imported in another file like this index.js. So within this journals variable, I have the whole journals array. Uh, this is just some logic for the development server. You can ignore that for a while. And then I also put already this into it because this is a little bit the hard part. And it's at least very hard to understand if you have no knowledge in JavaScript. That's why I already did this for you. This whole thing is reading in the data to the browser. So you can see here that it calls this CSV file and D3 comes with a function which is named CSV, which is able to take this file and to transfer the CSV file to a so-called JavaScript object. And uh, so that we can easily work with that. I show you in a second how that looks like. And it has some additional functionality that it takes the file and it also aggregates for the journal so that it counts how many publications were there in a journal in each year. So this is something uh, you would say, I do that in Python or I do that in R. It's completely fine to do so and to provide an already aggregated file. I thought I put it in there that if you are curious how JavaScript works and how JavaScript could be used for data science too, you can dive into that later and have a look what happens here. This one here then calls the function create this with our data. And this function create this is here, gets the data that we just imported. And from here, we will start working now. So before we do that, the most important function in JavaScript is console.log because that is like the print function in Python or in R. So you could just console log the data and when we now go to our browser and there is, uh, when you say inspect element on right click, you get this uh, development console here and there is the console there. And then you see that I get some warnings. Let's ignore them for now, but I also get my data here. And this is an array. So I can look into that. This array consists of 11 elements. And if I look at one element, we see that this is the journal uh, identifiers and the number of publications in that journal. And this is just for one year. So this is 2020. So there is a journal where already 15 publications were in. And if I go to the other array objects, this is then 2019. There you can see in the top 10 journals we published in that one here, 43 publications. We'll see in the end which one that is. And that is like the data structure we are working on. This is a typical JavaScript object. All right. Um, good. So this is the data we are getting in. And now we want to take the data, transform it in a way that we can plot it, and then bring it to the browser. And the third thing you usually start with um, when you let D3 do all your element access to the website is that you give it a reference. And D3 comes with this select method where you just pass in the ID of your, um, of your document element where you want to put the, put the data visualization in. So for example, when I go again to um, the index file, you remember we had this div here with an ID of this. And this is exactly what I'm telling here, put in the variable this now, this reference to this 
element so that we can work with it. And what I also do in the beginning is uh, I want to get the dimensions of this element. And this is what I'm doing here. And this is really nice modern JavaScript code. So you take the vis, what your div element is, then with the node function, which is from D3, you get access to the parameters, for example, the width, the height, and all that of the DOM element. And the node also has um, a method, which is called get bounding client rect, which gives you width, height, and some other parameters. But if you only want to pull out width and height from the result of that method, you can write it like that. This is called object destructuring. So we store width and height in these two variables. And then because it often looks not very nice when your visualization goes up to the, all the corners and borders of your web page, I will define some margins. So I define an object here. So this is a, data, a, a JavaScript object. And this object has a property V for vertical. So I want 50 pixels vertical margin on top and on bottom and a horizontal margin of the same size. So right now you have seen in a very short amount of time the most important data structures in JavaScript. I showed you an array. I also showed you an object. So that one with the curly braces is an object. And the one with the square braces that we saw in the journals here, that is an array here, an array of several objects. <clears throat> All right. And in JavaScript, everything works around the object. So that's the most important data structure that you can have. All right. And so right now, there is nothing going on on the page because we do nothing. And before we start, we should make sure that this div where we want to draw our visualization is really empty because it could be that from previous renderings of the page, there is some other data visualization stuff uh, left. So we can ask now D3 to remove everything within that div. And that works like that. So we have our vis, which is the data visualization element. And then I can select all children. And with all that children, I remove them. So this, with that, I'm really sure that nothing is on the page. So let's go back. I made that large. So there is nothing on the page. And if we go to the inspector, we can see that this is here our h1, this is here our h2, and here is our quiz, but there is nothing in. So this is the, the best conditions to start. And then the second thing, what you always do in D3 is you define your scales. So we want to have like a scale for all the years because we want to say that 2010 is on the very left hand side of our plot and 2020 goes to the right hand side. And I also want to know where 2017, for example, is. And for that, we define a constant, which I call X scale. And then I use from D3 the functional sc function scale linear, which will give us a linear scale. And this linear scale gets a domain. So that means we, the domain means from which year until which year should this scale run. And of course, I know now that it is from 2010 until 2020. So I just give the method this array. But I could do this a little bit more dynamically because maybe this visualization should run until 2030 and always update with the new data. And then this 2020 is not, uh, not uh, the, the current value anymore. So what I could do is I could use another D3 function. And this is the extent function. And the extent function needs an array of all the year values that we have. So if you remember, um, if I comment it out and we look for one moment at the data again. So I move to the browser and we have our data here. Then it was this array of objects and each object had a year property. So we need to read out that we need to get these years in all of the objects into an array. And one of the most used functions uh, in JavaScript so let me just clean that up, is the so-called map function. So I could use my data and run a map function on it. And now within that function, I say, okay, I give this a callback function. So the map function will run through every object in my array in JavaScript and put that object into this D variable. 
then I take this D variable. And from that, I want to have back the property here. So if we take just that and put it in a console log, should write that all the time. Um, then we get here this array, which only holds the years. This is exactly what we want to have. So um, now this extend function gets the years and the extend function just pulls out the minimum and maximum values so that it updates. And then I need to tell the scale, the scale linear function, also the pixel range that I want to use um, in my visualization. And this is again an array and I have to think about what is my starting point on the left side of the browser. Yeah, maybe I take our margin object and access the age property. So it should start at 50 pixels because that would be our margin. I could also start at zero, but then it's uh, sticking to the border of our browser. So let's start at the margin. And then I go up to the right hand side. So I take the width that I pulled out above from our this node. And from that, I subtract again the margin on the other side. So with that, uh, we have defined a scale and the scale is now a function. So for example, we could say uh, console log and let's take the X scale and put the year 2017 in it. So when we go to our browser, you see that I get the value 610 back. And this is exactly the X pixel position here on my screen um, <clears throat> where 2017 should end up. You can check that if I make my screen a bit bigger and I reload the page and then you see now it's a little bit bigger because everything moved around. So this really adjusts to your client's browser width. width. All right. Um, so now we have the, st the, the scale. Now we have to talk about the layout of our graph because I told you before that we want to have like this steam graph. And the difficult thing about the steam graph is that it's easy to draw one of these lines, but every other line which comes on top is dependent on the lines below because it gets shifted above, shifted above and so on and so on. And this is something of course you could calculate manually but uh, D3 isn't that low level actually. So it has already a um, function which gives you this stack design. And so we want to just set up this design and I call this a steam because uh, in database we call this a steam graph and D3 provides us the stack function. And the stack function needs some additional information. So it needs an information how this stack should look like. So if like you have one line at the bottom and every other line is building up on that, that's exactly what we want to do for now. And there is an offset method. And uh, from D3, we just take a standard function, which is called stack offset uh, silhouette. And then we also have to define the keys and the keys is the amount of the stacks. So we have to think about what are the stacks and the stacks should be different journals that we stack on top of each other. So we have to tell uh, D3 stack that our keys will be the identifiers of the journals. And I told you before that we have this uh, journals variable where I had the array of all the journals. And here I need to pull out this ISSN, which is the unique identifier. Could also use the name, but I'm not sure if there are maybe duplicate ones with different ISSN. So let's use this unique identifier. And so let's go to the journals, run a map function on it. And then I again get this uh, value D, which gives me the current object when this function runs through all the journals. And from D, I want to have the ISSN. All right. And uh, this, as it stands here, will give me a function, which when I provide the data to this function will transfer my data to a stack. So what I can do here is, I could just invoke directly the function with our data. And now uh, you may be curious how Steam looks like. So uh, let's have a look. 
let's console that out to um, to our browser. Hopefully with no errors. Yeah, so we get here an array. And you see that this array has now 10 different elements. So let me open those. This is the first element. The first element is again an array of tuples plus some additional parameters. There's an index, there's a key, which is a journal uh, unique identifier, and there's a length. So what does that mean? That is a stack basically, because let me start from the beginning. These 10 elements here in that array are the 10 different top 10 journals. And for each of these journal, I get two Y positions across all the years. So you see here from zero to 10, this is the 11 different years from 2010 to 2020 that we have. We are looking at one specific journal. And in the first year, I guess in that case it's uh, 2020, so it's, that's vice versa. The actual band in our steam graph should range from Y position minus 18 to Y position minus 17. Then for the next year, which is 2019, this band should go from minus 60 to minus 44. So this is building up the whole stack here. So this is exactly we're talking about the Y positions now. So for example, for journal B, this is the Y position start for this year 2020. This is the Y position end for this year 2020. And these are exactly the two values that we see here. This is just one year. This is for the next year, next year, next year, next year down to 2010. And this is, uh, of course, a lot of work which has D3 done in three lines now for us. Um, you could calculate this, of course, on your own, but I wouldn't recommend it. So you have now all the information um, already in your, uh, in your JavaScript. So you already know now, OK, you have Y positions and you have already X positions. Because remember, we defined our X skill here. So you, we know where to draw the years. And now we also know where to draw the Y positions. But wait, not exactly because the y positions are now arbitrary numbers so you saw those here like uh, minus 18 minus 17 so this is not really the pixels where we would like to put our data and this is also not dependent on the screen width or height because we haven't put it in at some point so we need a y scale to transform now these values into pixels and yeah let's do that so uh Let's call that a yeah, Y scale. And this Y scale is also a linear scale. So we can call scale linear. Just a side note, there are much more other scales like categorical scales, log scales, and all that, of course. And now, if, uh, as for every scale, we have to define a domain. And the domain would be. Uh, an array from the minimum value that we observe and the maximum value. So we have seen that all the way the values are in these um, duplicate, duplicate arrays and we would have to go through them and collect all of those to know what the minimum and maximum across the whole data set is. And for that, I suggest to um, define a, a helper variable, which we call all Y values, where we try to store all the different Y values. And they are in the steam variable. And of course, we use map again, because we want to run through all the elements within our uh, array here. And we get, again, this value D, which is the actual object uh, where the map function currently is. And you've seen that, again, within this steam array, there were these duplicate arrays. So we have to access these arrays again. And um, so we run on D another map. So this is going to be a very nested uh, um, statement. And we get from there another D, which is now one of these duplicate arrays. And from there, I just want to, um, I want to pull out the first and the last element, the second in that case. You could also simplify this a little bit. I, I wrote it like that, that you have a chance to understand what is happening here. And now we have a nested, nested array, which comes back from that. And there is a very convenient function, which is flat. 
which just flattens uh, arrays. And in that case, we have a depth of two because it's an array in an array and want to flat everything. So we get uh, all the Y values here. Let's just check that if we did everything right. Um, and this is here what we get back. So here's an array with 220 entries. And you see here, it consists of all the different values uh, that are in. Um, so now we could say, okay, we again want this minimum and maximum value. This is the domain because at the very bottom of our graph should be the minimum value and at the very top of our graph should be the maximum value of what this Y scale could be. And there is, uh, as you know, this D3 extent uh, function uh, where we just put all Y values in and then it gets from that an array with the min and max value. And then we need to again define the range. So on what range on the Y axis do we want to plot this on our uh, actual screen in the browser? And we want to run this from uh, the height. So you have to imagine that in the browser, we have here um, our field where we want to draw. And in the browser, the coordinates could be quite weird because zero, zero is here in the top left corner of your visualization field. And then the X values grow in this direction and the Y values grow in this direction. So we basically want um, our plot um, starting to be stacked from the bottom. So we start at height. And if I want to take the margin into account, I just write height minus margin dot uh, V because it's now the vertical margin that we want to use. And we want to go all the way up to our top margin uh, V which is then here at the, at the top of our visualization field. And you've just seen that uh, this development server from Webpack here just updates automatically the site when you change something in your files. And that's very handy to have. So now we have the Y scale. And um, the only thing we are lacking now is that we have all the values for the steam graph here. We could also transform all the values to actual pixels on the steam graph. But then I still need to draw these uh, lines, if you remember. So I don't know how to extrapolate or better to say interpolate between a 2010 point and a 2011 point. How would I draw this line here in between? I messed up my presentation, but anyways, um, how would I draw this line? And here also D3 comes in again with a mathematical helper function. And uh, we define a new function, which we call stack area, because uh, this is basically areas what we are looking at, because each journal consists of this line and this line and the whole area in between, but we want to draw this whole area. Let's call it stack area. And D3 comes with, of course, a function which is called area. And this is a path generator. So we'll see that in a second, what it really does when we have it on screen. But with that, we can really then uh, tell the browser how to draw the lines, how to draw the interpolations between the different year points. All right. Um, so how do we do that? Um, if you go to D3's documentation, which is quite good and extensive, <laughs> um, there is uh, the, the fact that this area function comes with an X method. And within the X method, you provide another function that tells the area function how to access the X data. And this might be now a little bit um, cumbersome to understand, but what we do here is for each of the data points we get to calculate, we get our data point D again. And with this data point D, we want d.data.year. Why do we want d.data.year? i show you why. Because let me just show you the Steam data again. So the Steam data, this is one data point of the Steam data. And you can see that uh, within these uh, Y values that we get here for every year, there's an additional information in the data object and the data object holds the actual year. So we want to have that. So what we say here is, um, 
what we say here is when you get the data point, when you get this tuple of, of Y values, then go to the data property and fetch the year from that. And now this is the actual year, but you don't want to be the year, the pixels. But remember, we defined our X scale, so we can just plug this into our X scale function. And the year gets transformed in actual pixels. And that is then taken by the area function to interpolate the lines. So now we have the X values in. Of course, we also need the Y values. And because this is an area, we have two different Y values. We have Y0 and we have Y1. So this is like the, uh, this would be the Y0 point and this would be the Y1 point. And we also have to tell this function, where is the data in our steam object? And again, it works with this uh, JavaScript arrow functions that you say, okay, in my data, it was like, there is this tuple array and the Y zero position was at the zero uh, position in that array. So I just tell it, yeah, let's, let's take the D zero here. And here it's the same uh, for the Y one position let's take the first, or in that case, it's zero base. So this is the second element in that tuple array, which will give us this value. And of course, this is now the raw values that are in Steam. These were this minus 17, minus 18 or so values. They need to be transformed into pixels. And for that, we defined our Y scale. So let's plug this value into the Y scale and same for the other Y value. And now, um, yeah, we have a functioning stack area uh, that we can use. So this is again a function where I can put data in and this data is then completely transformed into uh, X pixels and into Y0 and Y1 pixels for each of the different journals we have. Okay, so now it's time to actually draw, right? And when you draw in the browser, there is several different ways how you could do that. The most convenient way when you have not that many data points, meaning like up to 300 different data points, maybe you would use SVG, that's scalable vector graphics. I guess you've heard of that because you can produce SVG also with Adobe Illustrator or any other graphics program. And in SVG, it's not uh, when you have a circle, for example, in SVG, that's not an image of a circle, but it's a mathematical description of that circle. You have an X and Y position of the center and the value for the radius. And then the browser is drawing that circle for you, which comes with the advantage that you have always, um, that it's highly scalable, of course, and so that you always have sharp pictures um, with a very good resolution on your screen. And that's exactly what we want to do. So we want uh, D3 to create us an SVG. And this works like that, that we take our vis variable, where this uh, existing element, our visualization field is in. And then we just call the append method and say we want to append an SVG element here. So um, let me see what happens here. If we go now to our document object model, which is that one, we have again our div with the width. And now you see there is something in and exactly there was an SVG created, which is quite nice. Now we have an SVG. But we also have a problem. You see it here, this SVG is just 300 times 150 pixels um, uh, in size, which is a bit small. We want to have it expanded over the whole visualization field. And um, this is what we, what we do next. So uh, we stay in the same appending function and uh, give it some additional attributes. So there is this attribute method where you say, okay, I want to assign a width to this. SVG and of course we already know the width because we pulled it out at the beginning and we do the same with the height uh, where you put just the height in and if I go now back to the browser and we have a look uh, how that SVG looks like we see now it is as large as the div container um, so this is exactly what we wanted to have now the SVG scales very well all right um, and now we want to bring all the data in terms of graphics to the SVG. And when you want to draw something on SVG, you could use the circle, like I uh, said to you before. So you could just say, okay, I want to draw a circle. It has this uh, center and it has this radius. But in that case, we want to have the 
most possible freedom what's possible and this is an SVG path. So what I do is um, I do the following. I take my SVG that I just created and then now comes uh, the most famous uh, paradigm in D3. I do now select all elements that are path, paths in that SVG. Now you would say, okay, this SVG has just been created. Where are their paths? Where the hell should there be paths and how should they be selected? But it doesn't matter because um, D3 now sees, oh, right, there is no path at all. So what should I do? So then we say, okay, let's bind some data to possible paths. And there is this data method where we just put our Steam data in. And uh, that means Steam, you remember, is an array where, um, let me put it up. Steam is an array. Um, no, this is not valid. Let me comment that. Oh, something happened now. Ah, typo. Yeah, right. Steam is an array where we have for each of the journals uh, a subarray. And that means when I pass now this data here um, into the select all and data function, that means that D3 will automatically create 10 different paths for each of these journals. And every time this Steam data changes, the paths gets updated. And that's why D3 is called data-driven document because the data drives the document, uh, drives which elements there are. And now I need to tell what, what should happen when there is now no path, but there is data. So what should D3 do? Should it just add the path? Yeah, it should just add a path for each of these journals. And there's this join uh, method. And I just say, okay, add me a path for each of these uh, 10 different data points. And we can have a look if that already something is happening. So we go to our div, we go to our SVG. And within the SVG, exactly, we have now 10 different paths with no other attributes course, but 10 different paths for the 10 different journals that we want to visualize. So what, what we need to do is we need to tell now D3 how to, uh, we didn't need to tell the browser how to draw these paths. And that happens um, uh, with the so-called uh, D attribute. So each path has a D attribute. And in this D attribute, it's basically a string where you put all the pixel information in, where you tell the, uh, the browser, okay, move to there, draw this line here, do that. And you can think about now this gets very complicated when we take our data, which is the Steam variable and try to draw that. But the only thing we really want, uh, need to do is we have to provide our stack area function that we provided before. And that uh, already should do the trick so when we go there, we see that there is now really 10 different paths. And these 10 different paths have all a D attribute. And here you see this is created by D3. So for example, M902237 uh, means move the cursor within the SVG to position 920, 237. And then um, could we see that a little bit more of that? And then there is uh, here L, L means draw a line until 816, 249. So it's really a description where to draw lines. Uh, it of course looks not very nice right now, but it is, it looks promising already. So you would have here the years from 2010 to 2020. So it gets more publications over the year and there is a shrinkage in the, in the end because we are still in 2020. So there is not that many publications than in the previous year. So it makes some sense, but let's style that a little bit. So what we can do is um, we can add some colors now to these different uh, paths. Because when you remember here with our journals, I also already set some colors for this journal, so maybe we can grab them and add. And what you usually do is before you define the D, so it's a convention to define the D attribute in the very end, you can add another attribute, which will be the fill attribute. And here we could um, define another function, which takes D, which is our actual journal that the function is currently looking at. So D will be the journal. And now what we can do is we can take this D 
and look into our journals array. And arrays come with a method, method which is called find. So I want to find now the current journal where we are. So uh, the find method also gets a callback. So it gets the actual journal that is currently searched. And I want to look at the journals ESSN. So which ISSN does this current journal have? And I want to compare this uh, with three uh, equal signs to d.key because d.key holds the current journal ISSN, which is just drawn. And when I have found that current journal, I want to get the color property. So let's um, go back. And you see that nothing happens because uh, at some point I did, uh, let me see. Um, so we see that all the paths are empty and we have the fill attribute. Let me just check sometimes everything gets messed up. No, so this is really live now. And um, let me see, let me just, I have a, a sheet where I can grab stuff. Oh, I have a written journal instead of journals. Okay, I have a written journal instead of journals, so I need journals because that's my variable name. And now it works, <laughs> cool. Um, so now we have all these uh, stacks in color and it's quite interesting because there seems a journal which was quite prominent in the beginning of the decade. And then there was another journal coming into place. Um, very interesting. So this is the nice insights that you get from, uh, from DataVis. What we can do now is that often these um, strong colors look not very nice. So we can put some opacity on it. So pro tip here, there is an attribute which is called fill opacity and we can just set this to 0 0.8. And then these colors oops, uh, get a little bit lighter and nicer to look at. All right. So um, now in the end, we could add the axis again. Um, I will do that in copy and paste manner very quickly, but you can look at that uh, later on. So because I want to show you some another trick also. So these lines of codes are adding the X axis and we can have a look, it looks like that. And now there is one thing which is not very nice about this visualization. And this is these uh, corners here for each of the years. It would be nice if that is smoothed out at some way. And um, this is really easy to do in D3 because when we go to our, um, when we go to our stack area, there it is, to our stack area, there we define uh, the, the path which needs to be drawn. And here there is another parameter, another method, which is called the curve. And we can just take from D3 a function which is called curve cardinal. And this curve cardinal comes with another parameter tension. So I will show you what that does. And this really smooths out now our lines and draws very nice path, paths. Um, if we have a look to our path now, they are of course a little bit more complicated now because now they, they need to be drawn a, um, these Bessier curves they are called. And this is a little bit more complicated to describe. Um, Yes, so this is basically the visualization uh, in a very basic way. And it's often the case that when you have now the visual, you would say, okay, a legend would be nice. Maybe also some hover interaction uh, that highlights this path would be nice. Um, for the interest of time, I show you what I did um, in like half an hour more uh, to render this graph a little bit more attractive. So, um, I will also share that on GitHub later on. So let me go to um, another folder here and start that up. And I think this is running on another on port 5000. So let me just change that. Yeah, this is exactly the same data. Uh, but a little bit more attractive, I would say, because I added two additional properties. One is the legend 
And now also you can hover over it and see which journals this is. So this is all uh, implemented in D3. And um, I change the order of these um, bands here because often it's quite nice to not have a random order of the bands, but to always see the top journal where you have the most publications on top and then in a ranked order, all the other different um, publications and that calculated for each of the years. And this really, I wrote in plain JavaScript, this sorting function and the recalculation of the coordinates. And the bad thing is this takes, I don't know, 30 lines of code or so. And the good thing is you're completely free to design your visuals. Um, I had, for example, just this drawing and I wanted to do something like that. I had no clue how to do this in the beginning with D3. And then you start, okay, maybe there is this stack layout. And then you go, of course, to Stack Overflow and all these re uh, resources. And then you get these nice graphs. So let's have a look what these top channels are. So this is PLOS One, uh, which was very prominent in the beginning of the last decade. And um, then this journal here is Scientific Reports. Uh, I have no idea why this is coming up so strongly here. That would be then the uh, research question for, <laughs> for future um, data scientists on Scilab Lab publications. What I find quite nice because I'm working in the proteomics field, this one here is the Journal of Proteome Research and 2014 was I think also for the Letty Lab very good year, uh, publication wise, maybe this is why it's coming to the second position in the top 10 journals. Um, so yeah, this is how you could design a visualization with D3. And of course there's room for a lot more, for example, when I make this browser smaller, everything adjusts, but not the actual graph I have to um, reload the page and then of course the new heights and weights uh, are implemented but of course you could design that reactively um, that it updates automatically and that you get also on mobiles a nice version so um, is this the future how data visualization will be um, not really d3 is part of the future but I guess not alone because this is now just a simple visual and I don't know, we took around 100 lines of code to produce it. Uh, it's, we have not created modular elements. We cannot reuse um, the, the bands code, for example. So I would recommend to combine D3 with one of the front end frameworks like Vue or Angular or React, which are the most popular. But if you start from the beginning or you want to see something really exciting new, then go to Svelte. With that, you can really easily combine uh, D3 with very easy JavaScript for the front end. And yeah, with that, um, check out uh, my website, hicks.com. There have some more public projects where you can find inspiration for data viz with D3. And yeah, with that, thanks all for, for listening to this long talk, but hopefully it was interesting to you. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to come up with them. Thanks. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. Uh, happy to see everything worked out with the live programming as well. <laughs> um, so are there any questions from Matthias? Check if there's anything in any of the chats as well. So <clears throat> I was wondering, because I have no experience with uh, JavaScript at all, and <clears throat> I, yeah, you can't help but get inspired by talks like this. Um, but you also mentioned that there is sort of a love and a hate camp about JavaScript. So um, if you're starting out and want to learn more about JavaScript and uh, D3, <clears throat> uh, what would you recommend like to avoid ending up in the hate group? <laughs> Uh, the best uh, way is learning by doing, I guess. So if you have a small project in mind uh, for visualization or everything else, which is web-based, um, try to implement it. Um, uh, go to my GitHub, download the starter. There's also a vis starter repo where everything is set up and you can straightly go for coding. 
And then, um, of course, you start to Google. For example, you try to break down your idea into very small pieces. For example, in our case now, it was these uh, stacks, of course. Uh, so you would Google how to implement stacks in D3. And then you probably end up on a website which is called observablehq.com. I think it's .com, but if you search for observable HQ, you come to a project which is also from the creator of D3, where you where you have a large collection of small pieces of D3 code. And it's very likely that someone had the same problem and implemented that in D3. And then you can have a look how was that done in D3. You copy the code to, to your code base. You adjust some parts, of course, that it fits to you. And then you, with that, I think you learn the best way how to use JavaScript and D3. And of course, additionally to that, it makes sense to make you familiar with the core concepts of JavaScript, like that everything is an object, everything is function based. You've seen that with, with my lot of Ds and then the arrow function. So this is quite, this is why there are a lot of people hating JavaScript, I think, because you have to get your head around this uh, coding style. You don't have the pipes like in R or something. And yeah, but if you are used to it at some point, it's, it makes all sense. <laughs> Sounds promising. Okay, well, um guess that's uh, all we have for today then um, and we don't yet have a speaker for next month uh, but keep an eye out on the slack channel for more information uh, so thank you again matthias and thank you everyone else for joining us today yeah thank you yeah.